to the human right to water and sanitation. And there is still 30% of the world population which has no access to water, don't have the human right to water, and even worse, for sanitation. 55% of the world population don't have that right. So for us, it's very important to remind that, to work on the needs, to put people together in order to find the solution, the right solution, to open their mind, to exchange, because we need to find new way of working. Otherwise, we will never bring that right to the people. IWA is the reference network for professionals in the water and sanitation industry. And so far, the network has done a very good job in building an industry around water supply, around wastewater management, but it's not doing so well in non-sewer sanitation. And yet, 4.5 billion people don't have access to decent sanitation. And I believe this is an opportunity for the IW members to really come together and think what are the next type of technology, the next generation of technology, what type of service model, business model, that would actually enable a new industry to launch. Circular economy principles have an important role to play in ensuring that we are achieving sustainable sanitation and water management, especially in developing countries. And um, market-driven mechanisms, including business models, have an important role to play because they allow the engagement of private sector, but also allows us to leverage both public and private sector capital. My hope is that the work that we have done is integrated in different policies that are being developed, but that also offers information to private entities that are keen in investing in circular economy businesses. If we dig today 200 feet, 500 feet, and tomorrow somebody comes who have the big money, a rich person, they get 600 feet then your borrows is dry. Then somebody has come, again one more rich person, getting a thousand feet, then again your borrow is dry. So instead of digging a new bore wells, you can recharge old one which is dry. The rainwater is, is given free for us. So you can just, you can put it inside. That's important. So in India, we are implemented uh, 1,650 bore wells, 10 states in India. Rainwater harvesting is open source. Wow, what a, great, uh, what a great night that was, and uh, what, a, uh, what a wonderful way to kick off the Fifth International Water Association Water and Development Congress. It was uh, re really super, in particular, to see our Global uh, uh, Water Development Award uh, winners. Uh, it, uh, for me, it really, really sets, sets the, the tone in terms of what we can achieve. My name is uh, Tom Mollenkopf. I'm the president-elect for the International Water Association. That means that uh, I'm, uh, I'm serving a 12-month internship. Uh, so uh, I'd like you to fill in your uh, uh, little response forms later on just to make sure that I do get the job in 12 months' time. Uh, I hope you had a fun evening. And I hope you have a fun day today. We are kicking off this morning with what I think is a, a true scene setter for, uh, for our, uh, our conversations over the next few days. Uh, this, uh, this plenary session is about the human right to safe drinking water and sanitation. Not the human uh, opportunity, not the if I can afford it, not if I'm lucky, to be in a particular place or in a particular social uh, strata. This is an ex existential issue. 
This is truly about a human right. So, today we're, uh, we're also going to be live streaming. So what I think that means, for those of you who know a little bit about television, television hates silence. It hates passive people in the audience. Nobody gets energised. So what I need you to do is show your enthusiasm today. Uh, and I think there is good reason to show some enthusiasm. Our, uh, our keynote uh, speaker uh, this morning is certainly someone who uh, is, is up for the challenge of, uh, of exciting and energising you, so I hope you'll reciprocate. And we'll then follow with a, uh, uh, with a, panel, uh, a panel conversation. So, enough from me. Let's make a start on the, uh, on the real business of today. I'm uh, very, uh, very, very pleased, very personally happy to be introducing our keynote plenary this morning. It's Rosie Ween, who is the CEO of WaterAid Australia and uh, who's also on the global executive team for WaterAid uh, internationally. Uh, I've known Rosie for, for many, many years, having uh, served uh, with her when I was on the, the border of WaterAid Australia, and I can attest not just to her engaging personality and her intellect, but her total passion for water and sanitation. You might have seen her bio published in the, uh, in the program guide. Rosie's a passionate advocate for human rights, gender equality, and global access to water, sanitation, and hygiene. She has two decades of international development experience, and uh, she actually uh, lived uh, and worked in Indonesia for, uh, for a number of years before joining WaterAid Australia. Uh, she was uh, the Director of International Programs for WaterAid before uh, becoming, uh, being appointed Chief Executive in 2016. Rosie is, in my view, not just passionate, though. She's authentic. She's effective. And she leads in her team and the global change agenda in a way that is the best way possible through her values and her behaviours. So, please, give a very warm IWA welcome for our opening keynote speaker this morning, Rosie Wayne. Thanks, Tom. I was a little bit nervous before, now I'm really nervous. It's such a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you all today. I think the most precious, unrenewable resource that each of us has is our time. And I really thank you for gifting me your time this morning. I'd also like to thank IWA for the opportunity to address you this morning in this important keynote and also for our partnership. I'd like to also thank our wonderful Sri Lankan hosts. And I hope that in my keynote address, I can honor the wisdom, the energy, the vision that we saw in our opening ceremony yesterday. And thank you, Tom, for that lovely introduction. I am indeed passionate about the rights to water and sanitation. And I'm excited to be speaking to you this morning, but I'm also just a little bit nervous, as I said. And I always get a little bit nervous when I'm speaking to big groups. But I think I've been feeling this sense of expectation building. And I think it comes from the people that I've met since I arrived yesterday. I've met incredible leaders from utilities in Kampala. I've met some amazing researchers doing work in India. I've met incredibly passionate and driven people from civil society organizations and NGOs. I've met amazing consultants and people from different companies from around the world and met some amazing young water professionals like Francisco sitting down here from Mozambique. So I've been feeling this weight of expectation that's been adding to my nerves. So when I get nervous, the person that I always turn to is my 13-year-old son, Pablo. 
Pablo has wisdom beyond his years and I think one of the kindest hearts I've ever found in this world. And it was a couple of months ago that I was leaving home in Melbourne and I was saying goodbye to Pablo and he knew I was a bit nervous about the talk I had to do that night and he was still in bed. Pablo has a little bit of anxiety and so when he sleeps, he likes to sleep under lots of blankets and he always has about six pillows around him. So I gave him a hug and he was so nice and warm. And as I pulled myself away from his warm hug, he looked at me and he said, Mum, when you speak tonight, I want you to speak not just to one person in the room, but to everyone in the room. Well, that was a challenge. But it's the challenge that I take up today, and I want to speak to each and every one of you here at the Development and Congress. And I want to speak to you and share with you my sense of urgency, but also my sense of optimism of the things that we can do to change this world for the better. I believe that we can create a new story where the rights to water and sanitation are absolutely at the heart of making this world a fairer and more just place. I want to challenge us about how we use that power to change the world around us. And as I stand here on the 2nd of December 2019, I look ahead at the next 10 years that we've got to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. And I look back at the last 10 years that we have had since the rights to water and sanitation were recognized. 10 years, 120 months, 3,650 days. In some ways, it feels like a long time, doesn't it? But in other ways, not that long. To embed these ideas of the rights to water and sanitation into everything that we do, our policies and our practices. So I thought I would share with you one of the ways that I always try to make rights real for the people that I work with, our teams, our partners. And I'm gonna ask for your help, Francisco, to do this, if that's all right. And I'm not sure what the woman at security thought when I brought my bag in this morning. But it's really important that we remember the importance of universal human rights. Ooh, 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 ooh. I knew that would. Okay, so what the really important roll of toilet paper that we have this morning. Can you see it? I'm sorry, can you see it? Yeah, got it. So this very important line represents our universal human rights. We are all born equal. We all stand on this line when we are born equal. Yeah? Yes? Yeah. So this game that I do is called the game of life. And what I do is I ask for four volunteers to stand up on this line. And depending on what happens in their life, what discrimination they face, their ability to participate in decisions, they either go forward or backwards. So, one of the first events, of course, in our lives is to be born. As Tom mentioned, I lived and worked in Indonesia for six years. And while I was there, I was living in a remote community on an island called Rote. I was teaching at the local primary school and living with the headmaster of the school. We lived in a household of somewhere between 14 and 20 people. We had no electricity. We certainly had no running water. We had good septic tanks for our toilet. If I wanted to call home, I was about 24 at the time, so if I wanted to call home to mum and dad, I'd catch the bus and I'd go into town and make a reverse charge call. Some of the younger people in the audience might need to Google that. I'd make a reverse charge call, and then I'd catch the bus home again. I was warmly embraced into that community, so much so that my neighbors, late one afternoon, invited me and the rest of our household to go and join them 
at my neighbor's labor. So I went next door, and as I entered their front yard, I had to walk carefully because it was full of men and boys that were keeping Octo, the father-to-be company. They were playing guitars, playing cards, and entertaining him. The men and boys from my family stayed outside, and I went inside with the other women and girls. As I went inside Ernie's home, I had to duck my head to get under the low doorway. And as I entered the room, my, light, my eyes adjusted to the dim light. There was a kerosene lamp in the corner. And still, when I smell kerosene, it takes me back to that time in Indonesia. Ernie was walking around that room in bare feet on the packed earth floor in labor. And it wasn't long later that she reached up and grabbed a rope that was hanging from the beam from the roof, and she grabbed hold of the rope and squatted over a pandanus mat on the floor. And as she squatted and her screams and shouts in labor got louder and louder, the music outside from the men and boys got louder and louder, drowning her out. And she gave birth over that pandanus mat to a beautiful little boy who was named after me, Leroy. And it's only now, after giving birth twice myself, that I realize how lucky Ernie, Octo, and Leroy were that they had such a happy ending to that story. We know now from studies in Africa that women that give birth where there is no sanitation, no safe water or hygiene, face a three times higher risk of dying. I know that each and every one of you in this room would agree with me when I say that no woman, no baby, should die when we know how to prevent it. And we know that one of the key ways to prevent those infections is access to safe water, sanitation, and hygiene at births. So lucky Leroy, for him, that stage of life is a step forward. Another key stage in life is, of course, education. As Tom mentioned, I used to work in the programs team at WaterAid, and in March 2011, I was lucky enough to be working in Papua New Guinea. I was visiting our local partners up in the highlands, and we were doing a workshop around access to water and sanitation for people with disabilities. We had a morning tea break at the workshop, and I took the opportunity to get a really nice hot mug of local Papua New Guinean coffee. And I took my coffee outside with one of the workshop participants, a young woman who must have been about 19, called Simona. And Simona and I sat outside trying to catch some sunshine, because we were up high, so it was quite cool. And I remember sitting in that sunshine and the light catching Simona's purple top, and it just glowed. In that private moment, I asked Simona, how did she manage her periods when she was at school? She paused for a long time, and then she answered that she used to have to crawl to go to the toilet because she had difficulty walking and didn't have access to crutches at that time. Now, I don't know what you're imagining when I say she had to crawl to go to the toilet, but I've been to some of the schools in Papua New Guinea. And the, often the toilets are just a big, dark hole with some sort of walls around them. So the little kids, when they have a break from school and they need to go to the toilet, they go to this big, dark hole, and it's scary, yeah? They don't want to fall in. And so they go really quickly. And they do their poo, and they go out. And the next one comes in, and because it's dark and scary and now a bit smelly, they'll do a poo, but often they'll miss. So there's like this creeping circle of poo all around this dark hole. And this is where Simona used to have to crawl into to manage her period. 
I know that many women in this room will have struggled to manage their period at time. I know I have. But that struggle that Simona had, to me, is unimaginable. And it's no wonder that she didn't finish school. And we know what an impact that has on girls' lives to not finish their education. So for her, that absolutely was steps backwards. Another key stage in life is, of course, work. Work that gives you a sense of identity, a sense of self, an income. But of course, it's not like that for everyone. I want to share with you the story of Raza. And the facts and the experience that I'm sh sharing with you are based on experiences that are true, but this is not a real person, because Raza wouldn't want me to identify him to you. Raza leaves his home and his family every morning with a lie on his lips. He doesn't even tell his family his job as a sanitation worker because he is so ashamed. He leaves his family and goes to work, and his job is to do things like to unblock sewers. So he'll turn up to work and he'll stand up to a manhole but before he does anything, he'll start smoking a cigarette. He'll take deep inhales of that cigarette to try and disguise the smell and the stench of what he's about to enter. He'll be wearing his uniform, which is, of course, just a pair of shorts. On his feet, there are no shoes. But on his left foot, there's a white plastic bag tied up with a blue string with the hope that that might protect the wound that he's got on his foot from getting an infection after going in the sewer. He'll lift off the manhole, and as I understand it, he'll try and use different signals. Are there bugs coming out? If he holds a candle down, does it stay alight? looking for signals that it might be safe for him to go in and he won't die from the asphyxiating gases. We know that in New Delhi alone, records have only been kept since 2017, but what they are showing us, a sanitation worker dies every five days. And so for Raza, at this stage of life, it is not steps forward, it is steps backwards. And this is what I stand for and what WaterAid is all about and what we are all about, to address these inequalities. It is outrageous that on the 2nd of December 2019, a newborn baby will die every minute due to infections from lack of clean water and unsafe conditions. In this session alone, in 45 minutes, that is a heartbreaking 45 newborn babies. It is outrageous that today there are millions of girls going to school, and at their school there is nowhere for them to manage their periods with dignity. It is also outrageous that people with disabilities are not able to access education, work, and so many other opportunities in life because of the barriers that are put up around them. And this is what I want us to be talking about this week. How is it that we can come together? How is it that we can use this moment as we look ahead to 2030? We know that there's a big challenge and it is going to get harder with the climate crisis only going to exacerbate these inequalities. I want us to feel that sense of urgency but also a sense of possibility because we know what works. We know what works is to think about the different systems around us. We know what works is to ensure all the different building blocks are there to bring about these changes, to ensure that there's leadership creating a vision, to ensure that there are policies and practices in place, to make sure that there's the money to be spent well, people with the right skills and expertise, technology deployed where it needs to go. We know what works, don't we? We do. So why isn't it? Why isn't this happening? And this is our challenge. What I think we need to do 
is bring the energy and spirit, like we saw on the stage yesterday from those dancers. Bring that energy and spirit and change the story in our nations, in our organizations, to show how the story can change with the right to water and sanitation at the heart of all of the decisions that are made and to create a new vision for our organizations and our nations, and to make sure that at the heart of that story are steps that can be taken, steps that think about, well, who is missing out and why? How can we be making the change and eliminating barriers around us in our organizations? How can we be listening to the voices of people that are missing out and put their voices at the centers of decisions that are being made. And I believe that we can do that, and that is what I want us to be talking about and bringing about change over the next four days and the next 10 years. I hope that I have stepped up to Pablo's challenge and connected and spoken to each and every one of you. I hope that you'll remember the stories of Leroy Ernie Octo, of Simona and Raza, and I hope that we'll keep them in our hearts and minds as we think about the steps that we can take so that we absolutely can achieve our shared vision of universal access to safe water, sanitation, and hygiene. Thank you. Well, Rosie, uh if I didn't set the expectations high, and uh, well, Pablo certainly did, but you did not disappoint. Uh, any, uh, any nervousness uh, that, uh, that you have is, uh, I, I think, just a, a sign of your humility. So thanks, thanks so much for bringing home to us that this is not a, a theoretical issue that we are talking about. This is very personal. It's very real. We uh, now have the opportunity to expand on that a little bit, and uh, we have a, uh, have a very august panel to, uh, to compliment Rosie's uh, opening uh, a keynote. Uh, I'd like to uh, just, uh, just introduce them, uh, them briefly. Uh, so first, uh, on, uh, first on my list, and it's always helpful if I, I follow the order that it's written, uh, we have uh, Desigan Naidu. Desigan is the CEO of the Water Research Commission in, uh, in South Africa. Uh, it's uh, South Africa's only dedicated uh, water research steering committee and funding institution. Uh, but I think you know, we, we very often describe people by, uh, by their job roles, but uh, more, more than that, uh, Desigan is a, a scientist, uh, a leader, and he's an activist for positive social change, which is something we I think I uh, would agree we all need more of. So, Desigan, come on up, uh, take, a, take a seat. Uh, just uh, maybe come one, one in and leave me at the end there. Our, uh, our next panelist is Lillian Kaunda, uh, who is the Director of Public Health and so Social Services at the Mizuzu uh, City Council in Malawi. Uh, she's uh, been with the City Council since August uh, 2011, where she leads and teams, uh, leads and manages uh, uh, sustainable waste management, wash, disease surveillance, regulation of food-related business and social services. Uh, she's got a background in public health and uh, I think started out uh, her uh, professional career, for, uh, a career as, a, as a midwife, uh, which uh, I think, uh, as we've seen from Rosie, is also a, a phenomenal grounding for us. Uh, and finally, uh, our third panellist is Amanda Lofen, who is the Director General of Waterlex. Amanda's a, uh, a water governance expert, leading a qualified team of lawyers. She hastened to remind me uh, earlier, she's not a lawyer. I think that's a good thing, uh, but uh, uh, as a past lawyer, yeah, I'd probably agree. Uh, she leads a team of lawyers, policymakers, and technical experts with expertise in water law and policy. Waterlex has uh, a mission to secure the human rights to water and sanitation through law and uh, policy uh, reform. Amanda's worked around the world, including in, uh, all the way down in uh, New Zealand, where she oversaw the design, environmental consent, and multi-stakeholder engagement to a large community-owned hydro uh, uh, irrigation scheme. So, we've got a great panel. I should jump down and join them, and we should kick off a conversation.
thanks everybody for uh, for being here. Um, I think um, you know we, we had the chance to talk earlier, and uh, I hope we didn't use up all of our all of our energy because it was a pretty uh, pretty enthusiastic and vibrant conversation. But maybe try to tap into uh, some of those thoughts that we we started exploring. Um, one of um, one of Rosie's uh, 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 one of one of Rosie's ideas uh, in the keynote was about empowering empowering others, and uh, I, I suppose it'd be helpful if uh, we could we could talk a little bit about that. Before I jump into questions, though, um, maybe uh, I could get uh, get you to to kick off with uh, you know just a, a couple of observations uh, to uh, to set the scene. So, Designan, uh, you comfortable to start the bidding? Uh, thank you, Tom. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for that, uh, that address, Rosie. Uh, the issue of human rights and a human rights approach to organize for access to water and sanitation has been around for a little while. Uh, it's been a bit delayed, uh, frankly, because the human right to water and sanitation was only adopted by the UN in 2010. So for a long time, we did not have this approach. Uh, but there are places that have been working on this for quite a while. South Africa is one of those places. So South Africa has got a rights-based constitution which enshrines the right to water. doesn't talk too much about sanitation, and this is one of the disjuncts that we have to deal with. And that rights base in the constitution then translated into the national water law, and we adopted a rights-based approach to dealing with the backlogs that we had. And the backlogs... Maybe the first point to make about that, before we talk about whether or not the law has been effective, is that we have to be alive to the reason why we have a human rights dilemma in this domain. Uh, in the South African case, it's 300 years of external colonization and 50 odd years of internal colonization under apartheid with a, with a strong race base that has left a large percentage of the population without access to water and sanitation services. So using the rights-based approach uh, in the Constitution and the law, we managed to get from 58% coverage around access to water in 1994, and by 2008, that number had jumped up to 95%. So there is power in that. There is definitely, uh, it be becomes a good way to prioritize resources, it gets a good way to drive the system. The issue, though, is the issue of sustainability. So we have not been able to sustain that rate, and the last mile has proved to be quite challenging. And the issue is, once you put things out into the human rights domain, you also have to answer as to what happens when you don't achieve that human right completely. So one of the phenomena in our part of the world, and in many parts of the world, has been the concept of social delivery protests. So people go out on the street and say, we have this right uh, to a resource, we have the right to services, and we're not getting it sufficiently. So I think one has to have a very nuanced approach around how you engage this. That the constitutional right, uh, as it has been enshrined, not only in South Africa, but in many countries of the world, certainly helps you to get along that road, but you have to do very particular things in order to maintain it. And I think that's, that's the rubric that we have to deal with. Right. Thanks very much, Desigdan. Uh, um, so, uh, Lillian, uh, yeah, perhaps a perspective from uh, from Malawi. My opinion is, um, when we look at access, uh, right to good health, it is a product of a lot of factors. Among others is access to good sanitation, as well as access to potable water. In the case of peri-urban communities, um, I think that is the case I am presenting here. Uh, you will see that um, access to potable water might be um, there. However, access to good sanitation remains a challenge. As service providers, we also subscribe to the fact that the private sector plays an important role. But in this case, I present the private sector within the peri-urban areas. And these are the local tenants 
who have their own households, and that is where people are renting, and those are the manpower that we have working in our cities. In addressing access to good sanitation, I believe that these are the drivers. If they can be empowered, and that they improve their standards of their local um, housing areas, I think we can get there. Thanks, uh, Lillian. Uh, so, uh, Amanda, uh, tell us about your, uh, yeah, your, your, your insights. Uh. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank IWA for putting the human rights to water and sanitation at the top of the agenda, because I think that the needs of vulnerable people need to be put first. And we're going to um, achieve success um, to, to uh, water and sanitation for all only if we, if we do that. Um, if we don't structure the right enabling environment first, then it will be like closing the barn door after the horse has bolted. So who is going to pay for the poor if they're not included in the pricing equation from the start? The, the Human Rights to Water and Sanitation is an international binding norm. The obligation to respect, protect and realise these human rights is not only for governments, but it's also for business suppliers who are duty bearers as well. It's not only a nice to have, as you were saying earlier, um, it can also make good business sense. So, so what is the human right to uh, water and, and human right to sanitation? It's simple in concept, but it's actually quite difficult to achieve and quite complicated. How do you ensure, for example, that water services are available and accessible and affordable and the right water quality to everybody? And um, what do you do about that? So we need to include the most vulnerable and the poorer communities in the business equation from the beginning. There are several simple approaches that service suppliers can take. Um, we've developed at Waterlex some checklist tools which are available on our website. They're, they're freely available to provide a step-by-step -step guide on this. Some simple ideas include things like what, what contingencies are in place to supply water in the case of water shortages? Uh, or how do your facilities um, regulate, uh, include regular um, opening hours and how, um, and how can you make sure that everybody's aware of that and make sure it's transparent. So one of the hardest parts of scaling up is actually um, getting the funds to realize the economies of scale. And there are four ways that the human rights to water and sanitation can help with that. One is um, it can help the local government to trust private enterprise. Um, number two, it can lower the risk of investment if the government is supportive through subsidies or through regulations. Number three, it can create a high level of standards to protect your investment. And number four, it can provide a service that people might actually want. So a human rights-based approach not only does it help to create demand, it lowers risk, it can also protect your investment. And it's absolutely essential for real realizing national targets on SDG 6 and enabling all vulnerable people to have access to water and sanitation. Great. So, Amanda, you and Lillian both mentioned uh, the, uh, the, the private sector. Um, I'd be uh, interested to get some thoughts on what we need to do, what sort of policy frameworks uh, we need, or what incentives do we need to get the private sector to make a greater contribution to uh, the right to water and sanitation? Well, I, I think actually the private sector is being held back because the legal structure isn't there for them. And um, governments need to take more of a lead role in this. So if, um, if, for example, there is private sector solutions out there, but it's not legal for them to, um, to actually operate as fully as they would like to, the government might not trust them because they're not human rights based. 
So there's a, there's a space there to work between the two to create a lower risk environment by making sure that it's human right based. And, and then um, the private sector can attract the investment as a result because, it's, um, because then it becomes legal for them. So they're able then to attract the money to, to grow. Great. Uh, Lillian, Desigan, uh, do, you, do you have any thoughts on, on this? Yes, I will just pre-share our lessons. Um, in the case of the, tenor, uh, the landlords, we could give them access to the disposable loans, where if they get the loan and they improve the facilities. And uh, the lesson that we have, it's like having a revolving kind of fund, just targeting them. And when you talk to the tenants, they say they are ready to pay for the improved services. Uh, in addition to that, there is a lot of research that has been done in terms of what technology could be suit those environments in terms of uh, affordability as well as um, usability. I'll give an example for the squatters where it is swampy. I think that is where we are promoting the dry toilets. However, when these te new technologies are coming, they require also the skills, skilled artisans. So part of the incentive is like within the community, we should have trained artisans who can provide the services, who are able to build the uh, promoted technologies. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Tom, uh, I, I think, uh, but let, let me offer a different dimension. I, I think that the public-private divide depends on the economic model that is dominant in the system. That if the economic model depends on cheap labor, for example, and, and this, is, this is the colonial model, so deprivation is part of the model to maintain that system. If, however, the economic model is one where you take into cognizance that there is a huge cost to the system if people don't have access to basic rights, because there's a public health cost, there's an economic cost because you de-develop, actually, uh, then you take a very different approach to it. And I think we, we must engage at that kind of level. It's, it's not just about the solutions at the front end. It's you actually have to get into the depth of understanding why you are where you are. And, and I don't think we do enough of that. The second is that I'm not sure we take advantage sufficiently of what is available to us in the 21st century compared uh, to the 20th century. So we now have an ability with new technologies to do the last mile access in a way that did not exist before. So for example, in sanitation, the classical model for five and a half thousand years has been waterborne sewerage. And waterborne sewerage is expensive because there's a capitalization cost associated with that infrastructure. Now there are a fair number of sessions at this conference that are going to talk about non-sewage sanitation as the new way of doing it. Around toilet systems that are off-grid, that in fact pay for themselves because of the beneficiation associated with that. That gives us a new toolbox to actually organize for this universal access to both water and sanitation in a way that was never there before. How does that relate to the private sector? Well, this is a very interesting model that is available for the industrialization of water and sanitation. Because all of these new technologies can rapidly go to the market on the back of private entrepreneurs. And we could organize for a very different model going into the future of one, how government operates with the private sector because there are new models available. And two, to organize for that first tier access to in fact become part of history. And we then can build from that into much more successful systems. Thanks. Rosie. Thanks, Tom. And it's, it's really interesting listening to the different reflections and it really reminds me of one of the key things around the human rights approach is really thinking about accountabilities and thinking about what are the accountabilities of all the different duty bearers, no matter what their perspective from government or private sector, but then also how are they engaging with the rights holders. And there are some fantastic examples from, for example, in Timor-Leste, um, a small country to the north of Australia, 
that has some incredibly uh, powerful approaches of social accountability that are about all those different stakeholders talking together about how the government or the private sector is meeting their accountabilities and giving that voice of communities, both for them to understand their rights to water and sanitation, but to also be in a, a conversation about that progressive realization of their rights, recognizing that in many of the places where we work, you don't have necessarily immediately all the financing and ability to deliver rights to everyone, but to have that plan of how we will be progressively realizing those rights. And I think for me, that's something I'm always trying to keep in mind, that notion of the duty bearers and the rights holders and how that interaction works, how we're holding people to account and giving space for, for voices in that. Thanks. Uh, they, uh, they say that um, one of the, uh, the first casualties of, uh, uh, of war is uh, truth. But, uh, but perhaps the, the, the second casualty is the, the individual and uh, the rights of, uh, of, uh, of individuals. We, we, we talked a little bit about that in the context of water. Uh, uh, Designan, uh, I was just interested to explore you know, the, the concept of the, the weaponization of, uh, of water. Thanks, Tom. Uh, this is a brave and, and uncomfortable uh, concept, but it's been with us, well, probably forever. And you would think that in the 21st century, this was a thing of the past, but it is not. Uh, water and access to water, sanitation and access to sanitation is definitely a means of control. And in many theaters of war around the world, uh, the one that is spoken about the most perhaps is Palestine. And the UN has had certain declarations around Palestine examining this issue where you restrict the access to water, you deny the human right, and it is a a method of subjugation. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that it is used far too frequently in far too many places in the world, both in the classical theaters of war, but also with very local conflict. And the local conflict is about denying access or destroying the resource in some cases in order that people don't have that access. And all of this organizes itself to introduce a very new dimension and a very important dimension around the new barriers, if you like, to these human rights. Because in some of these theaters of war, the very folk that stand in the front line of the changes in the system, like supporting the SDGs, are in fact, with their other partners in the system, precisely the folk that are organizing for this to happen. So a move into that space and around that exploration is something that is really needed, and we need to have some very strong declarations around that. And it should not be restricted to the lawmakers in the international courts. It should also find its space in places like the IWA, where the IWA makes a stand against this and puts out the toolboxes around how to deal with it. Now, I hate to, uh, hate to do this because I, I think we're, you know, we're just opening up so many wonderful avenues of conversation, but I'm going to, uh, one, one of my KPIs is getting people uh, out uh, at least uh, within five minutes of the due time, so uh, uh, I'm going to have to uh, uh, draw, uh, draw this to a close, but I would like to get, you know, perhaps just a, a couple of final thoughts, um, you know, 30 seconds, a, a little vignette, and, and maybe a, a thought on what do you think are some practical steps that uh, you know each of us could uh, could take away? Would you would you like to kick off? Uh, um? I think everybody can do something small to help realise access to water and sanitation. And if you if you go through systematically through each of the criteria, just thinking about which vulnerable people may have difficulty accessing your services is one step that you could take. Having a look at who's involved in the conversations, are you making your services available to people who might find it a little bit more difficult to get there, whether it's because of their physical in inhibitions or cost or where they're located. So just have a think about it. Great, thanks Amanda. Lillian. Um, my still concern is access to water and sanitation, potable water and good sanitation to people in the peri-urban areas. 
As of now, we will see that we have parallel drivers in terms of bringing access to water, as well as bringing access to sanitation. However, you will see that there is no good health without proper sanitation. Like, uh, likewise, even when there is potable water, there is no good health when there is no good sanitation. It's my vision that we should see water and sanitation utilities. As of now, we have water utilities everywhere in isolation. But the moment that we try to merge the two components, I think we will deliver. I know the problem there is mainly with policies in different countries where the policy holder for sanitation is another department and policy holder for water is another department. Even that, in that situation, at local level, we can make these services together. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Lillian. Just again. Uh, yes, I'll help the term. Two quick points. The first point is that we should miss no opportunity to ensure that people know about their rights. It's absolutely pivotal. People, keeping people in the dark is a means of disempowerment. So we should empower people by making sure that they do know their rights. The second point is we are in an age of innovation. We need to get the technology to come to bear and play its part. We need new economic models, innovative economic models. We need new policy models to make this work. And we need a whole lot of social innovation to sustain this. Rosie. Oh, the joy of going vast after hearing all this, the vision from uh, Lillian of the water utility of the future. Let me bring it to what each of us can do as individuals. Because to me, the personal is the political. So what is it that you can do with your power? How will you use it? Will you use it over people? Will you give it to people or work with people? So be conscious of your power and think about how you're using it to really address the rights to water and sanitation. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope uh, you agree with me that uh, this has been a, uh, a, a really inspirational introduction to uh, our, uh, our, our conference. Uh, would you please join with me in thanking our uh, speakers, uh, Lillian Lerfin, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Amanda Lerfin, Lillian Coenda, Designate Naidu and uh, Rosie Wayne. Thanks very much. So we, uh, we now break for around 45 minutes. So uh, please uh, refresh yourselves, uh, hydrate, and uh, we'll uh, see you uh, uh, at, uh, at the, next, uh, the next session. Thanks very much. <laughs>